Salve te omnes. I am going to be going over what is going to be like a synopsis for each section of what we've read so far in AP. And I, I'm gonna, it's going to be detailed a little bit, and I'm going to try and get in through as much as I can. Um, but I'll start with, the, obviously, our first book we read, which is Aeneid 1. Um, this was the intro to the whole story. Um, arma virumque cana. You know, he sings of arms and a man. You know, the the, the battles that are going to come and also Aeneas. And, he, and Virgil starts us off by telling him he's going to go to Lawenia. He's going to reach Italy. And he prays to his muse. He says, oh, Musa, you know, causa uh, mihi memorande. He's like, you know, told me or recall from me um, be my reason to remember what's happened. So he, he introduces the muse here. That's, and these are like in the first 10 lines. Then he introduces the next big thing, which is Juno and her anger. Juno, she is the cause for the Trojans to be set off course and all their troubles. Because she hates them <clears throat> from what happened in the Trojan War. And what happened with uh, Paris deciding that she's not the prettiest of them all. And Juno's just like, I don't like you guys. So Juno, um, she, uh, and I have my book here to kind of just help me remember a lot of the specific names and everything. Um, but what she does first is she decides to enlist the help of King Aeolus. So, um, she, and I'll, um, uh, I'll put this here, enlists the help of King Aeolus, who is the king of the winds. And he sits atop this mountain where the winds are, and on the mountain um, he... Uh, is convinced by by her um, not conceived yikes convinced by her um, the marriage proposal of a beautiful nymph. That's King Aeolus. He's uh, got this big involvement there. And then the winds, they come out and they scatter out the ships. Um, specifically, I know there's one guy, I forget his name, um, who uh, ends up uh, dying. Uh, sadly, he like it's this, uh, uh, this helmsman he's called, and he gets tossed off the ship. Uh, so the, Ro uh, the Trojans they get kind of buffeted a lot. So there's a whirlpool, and there's this wave that's as big as the sky, and all this stuff happening because the winds are around. And then the storm ends by the intervention of Neptune. And um, Neptune, he sees the winds, and he, he hears what's happening in the sea because he's the god of the sea. And he's like, hey, what's going on, winds? Uh, you need to go back home. This is my territory. You cannot be here. Get out. And so the winds calm down, and from there the Trojans get separated into two groups. Uh, one reaches uh, Carthage. Another reaches a beach in Libya outside of Carthage. Aeneas is on that group. And so Aeneas, when they enter the Libyan sand, Aeneas, uh, he's kind of engaging his mind. He sees this big rock face. There's a very uh, beautiful ekphrasis, um, which I'll put here, ekphrasis of the uh, scenery on the beach. Whatever. Um, and... An ekphrasis is an extended description of either a piece of artwork or like a natural scene. And he talks about how like, you know, these are the homes of nymphs and all this stuff. And he sees uh, a group of deer who are walking by and he shoots some of them down, killing enough for seven of the ships, which are the seven ships that he was with. That kind of ends the storm. And then the next section is Aeneas... 
Um, we don't see, we don't read this portion, but Aeneas is clouded in a fog by his mom, Venus, and he is unseen by people, but he sees Carthage, and this is the, and starts the uh, bee simile, where he compares how bees work in the summer, and they toil, and uh, he sees Carthage, and uh, he's just reminded of how bees work. Then he sees uh, his friend uh, Ilonius. I keep for I, I I need to look and make sure I'm spelling his name right. Um, I always feel bad because I, I don't get his name very well. Ilionius. Uh, there's an I there. Ilionius. I keep forgetting. Uh, Ilionius um, was in the separated group and thinks he lost all his pals and Aeneas too their king or their leader and asks Dido for help. Aeneas sees Dido and he is taken back a little bit. He thinks he's, she's really beautiful and all this. So that kind of helps introduce to why he's going to fall in love with her later on. Uh, and Dido agrees to uh, help the Trojans find Aeneas. Or give them safe passage slash help to travel to Sicily, uh, where there is a king. Um, and that king is named um, King Acestes. King Acestes is a Trojan by birth who moved to Sicily, so there is safe passage for them. Eventually, the Trojans do go to Sicily, uh, um, er, or where uh, her his father Aeneas' father dies in Sicily, um, or he's buried there. Really, he's buried in Sicily. And then Dido agrees, and she says, "Yeah, I'll help you." Yada yada yada, um, et cetera, et cetera. In book two, we are thrown into. Uh, this is uh, Aeneas's flashback to the Trojan War. And the first thing we find out is about Laocoon, which I need to make sure I'm spelling correctly. Laocoon. He's a priest of Neptune. And he doesn't trust the Trojan horse. Uh, really, the gift of the Greeks the wooden horse, and he throws a spear at it, and he hears it reverberate, he hears it like echo, and he's like, oh, that, like, that shouldn't happen if it's wooden, like, that's so weird, um, and then two snakes are sent by Pallas, Athena, or Minerva, that end up killing Laocoon, and his two sons. The Trojans, they think that's a sign. They should bring in the horse. And that's how the uh, Trojan War really kind of gets to an end because they're now they're able to get inside Troy and, and destroy things. The next scene is um, where Aeneas sees... Hector in his sleep, and basically uh, Hector tells him to go. There's no point in fighting. He needs to survive. And then Aeneas sees not a ghost, but he sees Helen. But in the book, she's never called Helen because her name does not ever fit in Nidor very well. Um, kind of like how Hercules, uh, Hercules, his name doesn't fit very well in a, in a nice easy meter. He calls her Tindara. I wrote it down so I had it. Um, but he calls her Tindara, which is Helen. He sees Helen and he, it, uh, and he wants to take revenge on uh, the Trojans. Or revenge on her and avenge the Trojans. Uh, he just 
before that witnessed the death of King Priam, who was the king of Troy. After that, um, we see Venus comes to uh, her son and tells him to leave and to uh, escape Troy with his son and father and and Cruessa, his wife, but like he's gonna lose Cruessa on his way out. So she's just like, hey, you gotta go, but remember, don't forget, there's gonna be a land of Troy, or there's gonna be a new Troy in Italy. Go find that. Um, leave, leave. And it wasn't until his mom, uh, Venus, tells him to go that he ends up actually finally looking. Um, and she convinces him. She says, hey, listen, all the other gods are on the Greek side, like the, you know, Juno, she's there leading the charge. Minerva's was behind them. Jupiter's also allowing them to go. You know, you need to leave. In book four of the Aeneid, this is um, uh, the Dido and, uh, and Aeneas book. So it starts off with uh, a storm that drives Dido and Aeneas to stay in the same cave and do what what they did, I guess, in the cave. Um, and Juno and Venus, the backstory, agree um, to stop fighting another. And they marry, and I put this in quotes because they never get married by technicality, and they marry them while in the cave. And there's a scene where there's lightning that represents torches, the singing of nymphs, and, and all this stuff that happens as they are in the cave. Um, and then later, afterwards, we get um, Mercury comes. Uh, well, actually, before Mercury comes, comes even another famous messenger. So there's three of them. Fama, Rumor uh, is there, and Rumor spreads uh, the word of Aeneas and Dido. Yarbus, the king uh, born of Jupiter, son of, a Jup son of Jupiter, Ammon, hears the rumor and complains to his father, Jupiter. He's like, hey, I, I do so much for you. I'm your son. I'm really devoteful. I build temples to you. I, I sacrifice. I give you gifts. I do all these things for you, and you're just going to like – Screw me over. Like, that's my lady. Like, that's the lady I want. And now Aeneas gets to have her? Not fair. Mercury, and so Jupiter, he hears his son, and Jupiter's like, all right, all right, fine. And he reminds Aeneas through Mercury. Mercury is sent by Jupiter to give the message that he needs to leave. And go to Italy. His munus, his duty. He needs to fulfill his duty. Aeneas, he re realizes, like, all right, I made a mistake. And um, uh, Aeneas prepares to leave in secret at first. Dido finds out, and then she speaks to him. The breakup. So she's like, don't leave. You're a real POS. Um, why are you leaving me? I'm about to die if you leave me. Like, our love can't keep you. All these different things. Yeah, she uh, is really distraught by this. So Dido, uh, when she finds out, she speaks to him. And Aeneas has his speech and response. Where he's like, I never agreed to a marriage. I, did we sign a contract? No. I didn't see no marriage torches. Uh-uh. Like, listen, yeah, I like your hot and all or like you're cute whatever like this this what we had was kind of cool but not in the long term sorry i gotta go and it's not because i want to i am forced to go by the gods so it's not really even my choice um that's his reasoning why and then dido uh asks her sister to pile up her things and then burns them and herself well not burns them and then plans to burn them and uh and then kills herself on top of the pile. Anna, her sister, 
sees this and laments and she has a portion where she speaks and she's really uh, it's really sad and tragic so and uh and prays out to juno juno sees dido and sends isis god of rainbows and her messenger um, to release Dido's soul from her body because the, the soul of somebody who has killed themselves never leaves. Aeneid 6, that's the underworld. Um, and in the underworld, uh, this is, uh, we start off with um, the site of Charon, the uh, ferryman very famous. Um, so Charon, we see him right away, and we're kind of getting started first, and I'm kind of just flipping over to get all the names right of the rivers. Like the, He's at the River Styx, and he's at the River Coctus, uh, those two rivers, and then there's the other river. I, I always forget the name. Um, and they, and Aeneas is with the Sibyl, who is called the Wates, which is a prophet. Tess or soothsayer the prophetess um and she's called wates a lot she's never called the symbol um or she's called an older woman uh so aeneas is with her and she's the one who leads him through the underworld uh they see the souls of people who are buried versus unburied and he's kind of distraught by that what he sees um and he kind of feels bad for them um he has he like pities them a little bit. Aeneas does, uh, and then the Sibyl presents the golden bow or branch to get passage from Charon because Charon doesn't want to allow, and that's the rule: living souls, living people are not allowed on the boat. Um, but you know, Hercules did, Theseus, and Perithous. These so those three heroes who were involved in the underworld come up in that story that Karen shares. Like, hey, yeah, you know, don't forget Hercules. He came in here and, and basically dragged out Cerberus, and then Theseus and Pirithus they try to take Proserpina, the wife of Pluto, out, um, but they got stuck, and Hercules saves them uh, on his way out. Um, then the Sibyl drugs. Uh, Cerberus with a cake, uh, with honey, melee, and also with herbarum, with, uh, with herbs, and it basically drugs Cerberus. Um, after the drugging of Cerberus, they uh, end up in the uh, isle, and I mean isle, like, I don't know, just an island or a place in the section of hell. Where uh, famous dead women are, and Dido is seen. Uh, Aeneas speaks to Dido, but she doesn't respond, and she returns to her first husband. And I'm needing to remember his name. Skaeus. 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 S C H A E U S. Skyus, Skyus, uh, or Sikius. I can't, I can't pronounce it. Sikius, Sikius, something like that. Regardless, she goes to her first love, her first husband, and you know, Dido. She never responds to him. She just looks on, and and you know, he's like, it wasn't my fault. You know, yada yada. He gives the same kind of BS gaslighting thing that he did earlier to her. Then Aeneas, uh, and then the next section, Anchises speaks to his son. Uh, about the glory of Rome. So the first thing that's mentioned are are the arts, so like um, sculptors and engineers and stuff like that, um, medicine, invention, so things along those lines. Then he uh, mentions glory and war, and he brings up Marcellus. I'm going to put the elder, uh, who uh, famous Marcellus. He was in the um, a Punic Wars, uh, who earn the uh, spolia opima, um, these, a very famous term for like, uh, um, 
basically like the uh, spoils of, of, of a triumphant general. That's pretty much what he is. Um, and then Marcellus the Younger. And Aeneas sees a shade, uh, well, shadow, a shade who is dejected and, and looks gloomy. That's the young 19-year-old uh, Marcellus, adopted son of Augustus. Um, and that Marcellus uh, Anchises begins a speech that acts like a eulogy. And in that eulogy, he's um, talking about why you know he's dead and, and how sad it is for the Romans and and how he could have been something so great if he was the other Marcellus, if he would have been a real Marcellus. And and this is like Virgil, the author, uh, giving a eulogy to Augustus and his wife, Livia. Um, so this is a, a very famous scene. Um, and then there, Anchises leads them through the uh, gates of sleep, and they depart from the gates of ivory for not real shades. And that's how that ends, is Aeneas meets up with his um, fellow Trojans. Book seven marks when the Trojans will be in Italy. So the first six books, they haven't even touched Italy yet. So the next seven is when they get there. I'm going to pause it here, uh, and I'm going to make another video before the synopsis of Caesar. Wale te take care.